Good morning to everyone this morning and a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Uh, we have a very good lesson today taken from the uh, First Kings, the 19th chapter. And uh, I want to kind of back up a little bit into the 18th chapter and um, do a little bit of uh, uh, leading up to our uh, lesson in the 19th chapter. The title of our lesson is God in the Quiet Sound. And uh, the purpose of the lesson is to explore the different ways that God speaks to us. Um, you know, in growing up, uh, our ancestors, our grandparents, great-grandparents or whatever, always had these so-called old sayings uh, that, that I grew up with, and that means means a lot, and they they're all have good meanings, and uh, it gives us really uh, reminders of God and how un His unpredictable presence and power that often comes to us at in the least expected ways. And one of the uh, ones that comes to mind is God may not come how or when you want, but God is always on time. And um, one of my favorite was, your arms are too short to box with God. And uh, another one, God works in mysterious ways, divine wonders to perform. So all of these uh, kind of gives us a, a reminder and in, in the power that uh, that God can uh, come to us in le the least expected ways. You know, people are creatures of habit. And as humans, we want to know what is going to happen and how life is going to turn out. And uh, I would say that uh, the majority of uh, kids that finishes high school, getting ready to go off to college, I dare say uh, that the, the biggest majority have no clue what they want to do when they get out of college. They don't have any really a uh, whole lot of plans. But you do have some that really go to great pains and plans to chart their life's work. They really map out their future. But these persons often experience a sudden and an uh, unexpected change of heart and choose to go into another line of work. But the common thread to these sudden changes in their life is a clear inner call that empowers one to find fulfillment and, pers and, <clears throat> and purpose in life. And God has a strange way of divinely interrupting some of the best laid human plans. But you know, life teaches one of the best ways to reach your goals and purpose at any stage in, <clears throat> in life is to be the best at that to be the best at all you do in life with a clear understanding that your destiny might be divinely altered for the glory of God. Now we're looking at Elijah in our lesson today and he had a, a spectacular experience of fire and sacrifice on the top of Mount Carmel. And it had uh, seemingly prevented him from seeing that God can choose to come to us in mysterious and 
unexpected ways. His ordeal on Mount Carmel had left a lasting expression on the nation of Israel. Now this is coming from the 18th chapter of uh, 1 Kings. He had boldly challenged and defeated the prophets of Baal. And when the people saw this great feat, they fell on their face, faces and declared, The Lord is the real God. Elijah's great victory would catapult him into a direct conflict and death threat from Jezebel. Of course, Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab. And in this story is a story of jubilation and praise for the Israelites. But in this next chapter that we're fixing to go into, we're going to see where the prophet Elijah, he is afraid and he's running for his life. Well, after Ahab told his wife Jezebel what Elijah had done to the prophets of Baal, she immediately sent out a message to the prophet. And she tells him, May the gods do whatever they want to me if by this time tomorrow I haven't made your life like the life of one of them. And the text says that Elijah was terrified and had gone from fight to flight. And in his escape from Jezebel, Elijah was awakened one night while he was sleeping under a, a broom bush by a messenger who told him to flee to Mount Horeb. And it was there that Elijah would encounter God in a different and powerful way. And this is where we start with our lesson today from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings verses 9 through 18. There he went into a cave and spent the night. The Lord's words came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and they have murdered your prophets with the sword. I'm the only one left and now they want to take my life too. And the Lord said, Go out and stand at the mountain before the Lord. The Lord is passing by. A very strong wind tore through the mountains and broke apart the stones before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. After the fire, there was a sound, thin, and quiet. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his coat. He went out and stood at the cave's entrance. And a voice came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? He said, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and they have murdered your prophets with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they want to take my life too. And the Lord said to him, Go back through the desert to Damascus and anoint Hazel as king of Aram. Also anoint Jehu as king of Israel. And anoint Elisha from Abel-Mahola, who is Shaphath's son, to succeed you as a prophet. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazel Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. But I have preserved those who remain in Israel, totaling even 7,000, all those whose knees haven't bowed down to Baal and whose mouths haven't kissed him. Now, Elijah's flight from Jezebel had ended at Mount Horeb, after the messenger had given him a meal, he made a 40-day journey to this mountain. Bathsheba was located some 250 miles south of Mount Horeb. 
And can you imagine walking 250 miles on one meal? That sounds, uh, that kind of tells you that uh, there's a miracle present here. <laughs> uh, that God was with him. When Elijah got to Mount Horeb, he entered a cave as a place to rest and shelter for the night. And it was at this stopping point on his journey that Elijah would again have a real life changing encounter with God. Now, we, uh, you see the word uh, caves uh, mentioned uh, in, in, that was instrumental in the lives of many uh, biblical characters. Uh, if you remember uh, Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, he left the city of Sodom in the valley of the Jordan. He and his daughter took up, daughters took up residence in a cave. You see uh, the cave at uh, Makedah where the Amorite kings retreated after their defeat. This is from the book of Joshua. Um, the cave at uh, Aldalam served as a natural cavern and fortress for David when he was hiding from Saul. And Obadiah hid prophets of God in a cave. So the natural topography of Israel lends itself to caves. Uh, the mountainous areas often served as places of solace and reflection where God actually spoke to humans. And the question that God asked Elijah, why are you here? Now, do you think, did this prophet understand really what was going on, what was happening? Uh, it seems to uh, have been uh, to try to lead the prophet to a deeper meaning and purpose, really, in his ministry. Elijah had not gone to hear God. He was actually there because of fear of his safety. Uh, Elijah was now in a position to encounter God in a new and different way. He began to self-evaluate his work as a prophet and as one who was very passionate for the Lord. And he, he viewed himself as one who had suffered and endured public humiliation for his faith. And he took pride in knowing that he had been faithful to God his passion for the Lord was unlike his fellow Israelites who had openly rejected God's laws. So all in all, Elijah was confused and he wanted to know why one uh, as passionate for the Lord as he was and faithful, why he should be suffering persecution. Well, how had Israel abandoned God's covenant? Well, Elijah's answer was that they had torn down God's holy altars. They had rejected God. And this act uh, goes back to the uh, 18th chapter where it says that they uh, had broken uh, the altar on Mount Carmel and destroyed the uh, that had been destroyed by the prophets of Baal. And for Elijah, repairing this broken altar would once again show Israel's unity as a nation and as a covenant people of God. Well, Israel's next offense was that they had murdered God's prophets. Now, when you hear the word murder, that means deliberate and premeditated malice against someone. So Israel had intentionally and without shame killed the prophets of God. And Jesus later echoed this truth when he said from Matthew, 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you. Elijah says, I am the only one left. I'm the last of the Lord's prophets because Baal's prophets, and he said Baal's prophets number 450 and I'm the only one left of the prophets. Well, Elijah had earlier called upon God to take his life because of what he felt to be an ineffective and fruitless ministry. E Elijah was depressed and he was praying for death. Uh, he wasn't the only one that we read about that went through this. Moses, he wanted to die under the weight of leading the Israelites. Job wanted to die because uh, of his misfortune and he felt like seeking death would be a treasure to him. Jeremiah spoke of how Judas survivors who experience God's wrath would seek death. And then there's Jonah. His disgust at God's mercy toward Nineveh, it caused him to prefer death over life. Well, the Lord told Elijah to go and stand at the mountain where God would make the divine presence known. He was to go and wait for God to give him a fresh revelation that would bring meaning to his chaotic life. So Elijah's expectation would be met, but it was not going to be met in the way that he thought it was. There was four manifestations that was delivered to Elijah. First, observed a very strong wind. It tore through the mountains. It broke apart the stones. It was of hurricane force. Now, when we think of hurricanes in our lifetime, um, we see the meteorologists when we have a hurricane, they, they decide what category hurricane that it is, is how much destruction that it's probably going to cause. And a category three hurricane has uh, wind forces of up to 130 miles an hour, and it can easily destroy well-built homes, apartments, and industrial buildings. So you can only imagine the force of a wind that shatters and breaks apart stones. And this, this is what Elijah saw. His next appearance, his next experience was the earthquake. And it doesn't say what the extent of the power of the earthquake was, but it shook and trembled the earth. Uh, the third manifestation came in the form of power, uh, fire. And this could have been, the fire could have been a natural offshoot from the earthquake or, or uh, a display of heavenly fire. It doesn't really say. But God was not present in these supernatural displays of power. Elijah had expected God's presence to be through one of these means. And then you had the quiet sound, which he described as a gentle whisper. Elijah would receive this divine revelation and the scripture says that he wrapped his face in his coat that showed that God's presence got his attention and conviction of Elijah. God's still, quiet voice reminded Elijah that 
the Lord's divine manifestations are not limited by human reasoning. And that is still true to us today. God speaks and acts in ways that goes beyond our human comprehension. You see, God used an east wind to push back the waters of the Red Sea. He used a violent earthquake to shake the prison foundations and bring release to Paul and Silas. He sent fire in response to Israel's grumbling in the wilderness and also in response to Elijah's prayer. Fire, wind, and other natural elements were often uh, objects of worship by pagan religions. And Moses had made it clear to these Israelites that they were to worship, they were not to worship the creature nor the created, but instead they were to worship God and God alone because he was the divine creator. God uses simple and foolish things to confound the wise. Weak things to, sh to shame the strong. Just think about an infant in a basket floating down the Nile River or a teenager with a slingshot and five smooth stones opposing a Philistine, <clears throat> a Philistine giant, a lad with two fish and five barley loaves, a baby born to a virgin named Mary. For Elijah, it was through a quiet and gentle voice whereby God's power, purpose, and mission were to be revealed. Now the prophet was still not sure of his worth as a servant of God. It appears that although Elijah was in the presence of God, like Jonah, he somehow did not capture the reality of the moment. His concern for fallen and disobedient Israel had not allowed him to see the God of restoration. God's direction to Elijah were specific and direct. He was to continue his prophetic ministry to the nations. He was to address the political and spiritual needs of the people. In addition, Elijah would anoint his successor, Elisha, as a witness that God would keep the covenant with Israel and all humankind. First, God told Elijah to go back through the desert to Damascus with the assignment to anoint Hazel as king of the country. Hazel was the from uh, Aram. Hazel was uh, one of the most powerful kings of the nation of Aram. He later served as one of God's agents in destroying Baal's worship. On the other hand, Hazel would be one of Israel's key adversaries and kind of thorns in the flesh during this king's 40-year reign. Secondly, God told Elijah to anoint Jehu as king of Israel. It would be at the hand of Elisha that Jehu would be anointed as the tenth king of Israel. It was under King Jehu that the house of Ahab would be destroyed and Jezebel would meet her end. In 2 Kings <clears throat> tells us the story of how Jezebel sought to secretly and deceptively destroy Jehu as the new king. And while she was standing 
on the balcony of the palace of watching Jehu ride into the city in his chariot. Palace officials threw her over the wall at Jehu's command. Her public death was the fulfillment of Elijah's prophecy that her corpse would lie in the street and dogs would lick her blood. And finally, God commanded Elijah to anoint Elisha to succeed. This was not God's reprimand or punishment of the prophet, but it was holy confirmation that God's word and miracles would not cease on behalf of the righteous. So Elijah's prideful attitude of, I am the only one left, was countered by the Lord's words to him that Jehovah always has a faithful remnant. And you know, there are times in our lives that we feel like God has left us. Um, we feel alone. We feel deserted. But as people of faith and part of God's holy covenant community, God always has a word of hope and promise to the righteous. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for your faithful and sustaining presence. Thank you for all the ways you speak your words of guidance, hope, peace, joy, and love into our lives. Use us to serve as your messengers to share your love and faithfulness with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.